our Father and our God. Again, we stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Thankful for the privilege and the opportunity that's ours to worship you and feast upon your word. May the Holy Spirit take this time stripping away foolishness, filtering out the ignorance of our human minds, but opening our hearts to the truth of thy word that we might grow in grace and in the knowledge of you, Jesus Christ our Lord, in whose name I pray. Amen. Hi again, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the book of Ruth, verse by verse, and in our last study together, we had reached the 17th verse of chapter 2. You all know the story. Uh, Elimelech and his wife Naomi had gone to Moab, and their two sons had married girls from Moab. All of the men died in this family, leaving Naomi and her two daughters-in-laws. And Naomi had heard that there was food again in Bethlehem because they had left Bethlehem because of a famine. They had left Judea because of a famine. And I believe that Naomi is a picture of the nation Israel driven out of the land and then called back to the land by God for the famine was over. She, uh, she heads home. One of her daughters-in-laws is enticed to stay in Moab. Ruth goes with Naomi. They get back to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is in the spring. Uh, barley harvest uh, lasts about three weeks, maybe three and a half weeks, followed uh, almost immediately by the wheat harvest, which lasts another three, three and a half weeks. You know, so we're looking at the entire harvest season being somewhere between six and eight weeks, probably about seven weeks. So they come back at the beginning of barley harvest. They, they haven't been back very long. The people in Bethlehem welcome them back with open arms. But Naomi is not near as excited, not near as ecstatic and happy as those who welcome her home again, which I believe is a picture of Israel's condition today. When God brings him back into the land, then we find that her husband had a kinsman, his name was Boaz, and Ruth goes out to glean. They need food. They don't have any money. They, they don't have any, any food. They're back at barley harvest. And, and one of the things that she can do is join herself to those poor and impoverished members of the nation of Israel and glean in the field so that they might have something to eat. So they might have parched grain to eat. And we found out that as chance would have it, that God had ordained that, that Ruth land on the field that Boaz owned. She landed on the field of Boaz. She asked that she be able to glean among the reapers, the harvesters, where she'd get more grain, indicating uh, the great interest that she had in the grain and, and the, the great necessity that they had. The foreman didn't know whether she could do that or not, so apparently she had to wait until Boaz appeared on the scene, which I believe was all morning. The text doesn't tell us how long, but it was quite a while that she lingered and she waited there where that Boaz then appeared and, and told her that she could. And in fact, told her not only that she could do that, but that he had charged the young men not to, to harm her, not to make any advances toward her. Uh, she acknowledged that, as, that uh, 
uh, this was an act of pure grace. I mean, she was from Moab. She recognized that it was pure grace. And she hadn't been in, uh, in Israel for very long. We noticed from the text that as we were going through that section of uh, Ruth that, that she didn't exalt herself. And Boaz makes a, a fantastic statement that she's come to trust the Lord God of Israel. And she says, let me find grace in your sight. And it's another fabulous statement. I don't have anything in me that's worthy of grace. You know, it's amazing that a girl from Moab would know that. And modern Christians today, in the main, don't seem to realize that, that it is extremely common for modern uh, thought to say, well, the reason that Noah found grace is because he deserved it. You know, Abraham found grace. You know, so there's something good in Abraham. Even though God declares there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that doeth good, not one. There is none that seeks after God. None that seeks after God. Did Ruth seek after God? No. If God showered grace on Noah because of something that he did, then, well, then it wasn't grace. It wasn't grace. That's the clear declaration of Scripture. That is what Scripture says. If Noah deserved it, then it's pay. It's reward. But it surely isn't grace. I think the Holy Spirit expects us to see in this that Ruth's, Ruth's eyes have begun to open. They've begun to open and, and she realizes that the, the pagan environment from from which she came was far different than where she presently was. You know, why should I find grace in your sight? It seems to me like in Moab, she would have, she would have said, well, there's got to be something in me that's worthy of, of favor. There's got to be something in me that's worthy of grace. She would have probably said that in, the, in this land of strange gods. Why should I find grace in your sight? Why would I find grace when there's absolutely nothing in me that's worthy of this? Yet she hasn't grown up a whole lot because that's the common Christian response. At least she's asking the question. I think I've mentioned several times that if you're seriously trying to figure out why God loves you, well, you can quit doing that. There's not one single reason that God loves you other than that you're His. You're His child. That's why He loves you. And that's what Ruth is saying. And that shows some spiritual maturity. It isn't very much. You know, she's just gotten back from a pagan country. I'm lower than the lowest of your handmaidens. The Hebrew says, I'm not at all equal to even one of your handmaidens. As far as Ruth is concerned, there isn't any reason that Boaz should grant her something that none of her handmaidens have. Or none of his other handmaidens have. No reason. The other gleaners can't, they can't glean among the reapers. First of all, it's a dangerous position. I pointed that out. She really shouldn't have asked for it. Almost makes you think of, of, you know, of the verse, Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves, and, and Boaz grants her permission and, and says that he's commanded his young men not to touch her. It is a beautiful picture to us that the Lord knows what position that He's put us in. And the Lord has, has made commandment that nothing 
touches us that doesn't go through His loving hand. You know, why can't we just take God at His Word? You know, if we're going to go through this life, folks, if we're going to do it by feel, then, man, we've got a rocky road in front of us. But if we're simply willing to take God at His Word, then what difference does it make? What difference does it make whether we're rich or poor, sick or well, healthy or happy or anything else? Anyway, He loves you. Never, ever will He forsake you or cease to sustain and uphold you. Ruth is protected by Boaz's order, not the restraint of those young men. And at mealtime, He commands her to eat with them. You know, you got a bunch of people gleaning there who aren't invited to sit at His table and eat. You know, they got to feed themselves. What are you going to do today? Well, I'm going to go and I'm going to try to get some grain for us. I'm going to glean in some guy's field. Well, you better pack a sandwich. You better pack a lunch. You know, because, you know, they're not going to feed you. And there's not a McDonald's, you know, or a Burger King on the corner. You know, I mean, you're going to eat by yourself. And there are a lot of other reapers there that know that. And they're not invited to eat at Boaz's table. And many of the servant girls wouldn't be invited to eat at the table. At mealtime, Boaz said to Ruth, Come here and eat bread and dip thy morsel in, in vinegar. You know, I read that and I thought, yeah, you know, it doesn't sound very good. The basic Hebrew, I believe, means a red wine or, or something you know, akin to that. I think that's what the Hebrew says. So she sat down beside the reapers who are now being fed. Why? Why aren't they there? The rest of them there. She's not there by invitation. She's there by command. And I believe the picture is by the command of God we eat at His table. She's a poor girl, a foreigner from a pagan country. She's destitute. She virtually needs to glean in order to eat. She's eating at the Master's table. And that, folks, is where we eat. In fact, I believe we're doing that right now. The food that's refreshing in the hour of hunger and thirst. That which meets the hour of need is what Boaz gives her. And so he reaches for uh, the roasted grain, the roasted corn, whatever it was. The Hebrew word is roasted. And she ate it and was sufficed and left. Folks, she didn't provide a bit of it. She didn't pay for it. She didn't ask for it. And she had food left over. She was completely, totally satisfied by what He provided. And she had that which was left over. Now that's very important because when she gets home, verse 18, she has enough left over to feed Naomi. Now don't get the idea that Naomi eats the grain that Ruth gleaned. It's not ready to eat yet. That hasn't been roasted. So Ruth gets enough at the master's table to not, not only satisfy her, but to satisfy her mother-in-law, Naomi. You know, I believe the picture is beautiful. That as Israel is going to be used to reach the Gentiles, so the Gentiles are going to be a blessing for Israel. So when she rose up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and reproach her not. And he says, I'm going to do more for her. You know, he's expanded on his earlier permission. 
He even goes further than that. He says, pull out some extra handfuls of grain and throw it down so that you can get even more. And that's more than he said originally. Now, Hollywood, you know, they want to say that, well, that's because he suddenly became infatuated, you know, once he got to know her better. I don't believe that's the purpose of this book. I believe this scripture is given to teach doctrine. I believe it's given to teach us the person and the work of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That's what He's provided. And it's more than enough. It's more than sufficient. It's more abundant than we could have ever asked for or even imagined. You know, when people quote the verse, you know, he's well, he, you know, he's able to, to do exceedingly, exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. Well, you know, that usually means millions of dollars and, you know, win, you are winning the lottery, you know, Ro, Ro, Rolls Royces or Jaguars or, or, or late model pickup trucks with nice uh, tail, you know, uh, these new tailgates and whatever, you know, that's what that means. You know, or multi-engine airplanes, or a golf score of 48 for 36 holes. You know, you know they dream of fantastic things. You know, the perfect life, the perfect marriage, perfect kids, perfect, 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 perfect everything. No trouble, no trials, no tribulations, nothing. You know. They dream of... of the most fleshly, carnal, not spiritual things. No place in the Word of God do you have the right to dream like that. What the picture here is, is the finished work of Christ being sufficient. You know, and, and again, the human mind, you know, it says, now, now wait a minute, you know, if God's a provider, why didn't He just give it to her? Why does He have, you know, them pull it up and then throw it on the ground. You know, now she's got to pick it up and carry it. Why in the world? It, it, if He's the Creator of, of the universe, and we are His children, why doesn't He just hand it to her? You know, on a silver platter. And I think that's because, you know, I believe the Word of God is teaching that we have faculties that He expects us to use. I also know that Hebrews says we are to labor to enter into His, what, our, we're to labor to enter into our labor? No, we're to labor to enter into His rest. Everybody that's listened to me for, very, for any length of time at all knows that I absolutely do not believe in, in the free will of men. That I absolutely believe in the sovereignty of God. But I also believe that we are the children of His household and that God is instructing us and training us and bringing us up like, like a loving parent would or should up in the way that He would have us to go that we might learn what it means to trust Him, to rest in Him. Folks, listen to me, please. The strange paradox of the Christian life is that is that when we rest in Him and what He's done for us, that it is then that we produce. Okay? It's when we're weak that we're strong. Folks, please listen. Please listen to me. We're living in strange times. We're living in perilous times. I believe we're living in the time of those birth pangs. We're living at a time in which God has allowed Satan to turn everything upside down, back up on its head, <coughs> turn everything around, where that, that, that right is wrong and wrong is right, and good is, is, is spoken of as evil, and evil is spoken of as good. and Everything's backwards and upside down. I don't know how many times I've mentioned that 
that when it comes to the gospel of, of our Lord Jesus Christ itself, we put the cart before the horse and we put man in front. We elevate man. We, we denigrate God. We push down God. We, we give glory to self. We don't give glory to God. And what we're looking at here in the book of Ruth is grace. You cannot even take a... a a sideways glance at the book of Ruth without seeing the marvelous grace of God and the truth concerning what God has done for his people not what he just not just what he's done in the past but what he continues to do all throughout our lives and there's such comfort in these truths and so few seem to care about these things. But Lord willing, this ministry, this ministry will, will continue on, will stay the course, God willing, and continue to preach the truth of the loving, the, I, I, of a God who is loving and is sovereign, who knows the way that we take. And when He's tested us, we shall come forth as gold, that, he, that he, he bottles our tears. He's cast our sins as far as the east is from the west. He's buried them in the depths of the sea to be remembered no more. What more could Christians today want than what they have received? It's, it's not a question, folks, of whether or not you've received these things or not. It's, it, the question is whether you realize that you have received them. That's the question. And my heart aches for, for you people out there. It aches every single day for all of those out there, all of, all of His people who, who just are they're free, yet they live like slaves. They're rich, yet they live like poor, like they're poor. When we are so rich in Christ with all the many blessings that we received, and you cannot see, it is hard not to see that in the picture here of, of, Booth and Ro, of, of Ruth and Boaz. It's impossible to miss that unless you're just you know, reading this half asleep. You know, in Hebrews 4, we read, uh, There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. For he that is entered into his rest, he is also ceased from his own works as God did from his. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest. Labor, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. And that's referring to Israel's unbelief in the wilderness when they didn't trust God. You will never know what it means to rest in Him unless you have a reason to really be concerned about you know, His book, the truth, what God has said is true about you. I believe it's God's purpose to teach us. And He expects Ruth to pick this up. Sure, I mean, He could have handed it to her. He could have done better than that. He could have sent it by FedEx to her house. To Naomi's house. She wouldn't even have to carry it. Of course He could do that. He could stick the food in your mouth. Hey, better than that. Hey, you know, why, why make you eat it at all? Let's just have it all pre-digested. You know, don't even have to eat. You know, could God do this? Well, of course He could. Would it be best for you and me? No. The law said that when you harvested your grain, you didn't go into the square corner of the field. You know, you, you just sort of, you know, swoop around it. You know, uh, uh, and uh, leave a little in the corner for the poor and you don't have to make sure that you pick up every little tiny you know speck of of corn or grain or or wheat or barley 
you know, just, you know, if it falls on the ground, fine. Leave it there for the poor. They'll clean up the field. That's what the law said. But no place in the law. I challenge you to find any place in the law where the reapers pulled out grain and threw it on the ground so the gleaner could get it. This, this is not law here, folks. This is grace. Boaz didn't have to do this. We are looking at the grace of God dealing tenderly with someone who's coming out of the flesh into the Spirit. And like Revelation, there is nothing chronological about Ruth. You can't even take and cement into stone all of the symbolism that we see because I believe that as, this, as we go through these chapters in Ruth, we see that Ruth may perhaps at, at times be, represent the Holy Spirit. At, at other times, Ruth may represent Israel. And there are times where our, our Naomi may represent Israel. And Naomi may represent the Holy Spirit. There are times where Ruth may represent the church, but there are times where Ruth rep, represents much more than the church all of redeemed humanity from all dispensations. We have to be careful as we go through this. Not read anything into the text. And as far as all that, the, the beautiful imagery, the symbolic uh, imagery that's there, I don't have a problem, not one bit of problem with any view that you take concerning that symbolism as long as it doesn't contradict Scripture. You don't have to agree with me on any of this. But I'm not about to take and look at some picture in Ruth and, 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 a, and, a, and, and attach some symbolism to it that, is con that contradicts all of the rest of Scripture. So we have to caution ourselves as we go through this beautiful book of Ruth. You know, so just to... <laughs> Just to root, well, I'm really going around the mountain here, but just to review briefly, you know, we saw in chapter one, we saw our kinsman redeemer, a relative, we saw a relationship, okay? We saw one already redeemed, brought back, not brought back to be redeemed or not redeemed along the way. Someone that God, who belonged to Christ, redeemed and brought back, like the prodigal son, Gentile Ruth from a land that God had cursed. That's Israel in unbelief. That's, I see that as Israel in unbelief. I see that as the believer in, you know, in lost, you know, total depravity. Okay? A land of death. Naomi's, no wonder it's that we see death in this. Naomi's husband and sons. Death to self in Naomi. So, you know, I pointed out in my past videos, so death works in us, but life in you. You could read that as death works in, worked in Ruth. Or death worked, you know, in Naomi, but life in you, Ruth. Israel being forced back into the land. The Gentiles grafted in. Everyone in the city there rejoicing upon their return, as is the case when Israel returns. Barley, wheat, harvest, season, spring. You can't, you can't read fall into that. God's judgment, we see that. Winnowing, the separating the grain from the chaff, the sovereign grace, the direction of a loving God. We saw all that in chapter 1. Chapter 2, we see fellowship, service, reward. That, that reward including abundance. Israel being a blessing to the church. The church being a blessing to Israel. We see God's protection. We see Ruth's abiding or remaining in that field. Going nowhere else. We see unity among the laborers, fellow laborers. We see, Sue, uh, we, we see uh, Ruth's 
uh, preoccupation, her focus being on that field, on Boaz, harvesting, again, winnowing the, 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 uh, the separating the wheat from the chaff. Again, we see that. Feasting together on the same, the same food, drinking of the same water, the sovereign grace and direction of a loving God. When we get to chapter 3, oh man, once again, more, more winnowing, more separating the grain from the chaff. The Holy Spirit desiring rest for Ruth. All that thou sayest unto me I will do, Ruth says. The lovely appearance of Ruth. I, what difference would it make that God would put in the text what Ruth was to wear? Well, it, to me it seems more than obvious. Her raiment, you know, how God sees His, his own people. as a sweet smelling savor a fragrance and then we come to see an amazing picture folks an amazing amazing picture of our our identification with Christ in his death and resurrection i believe in chapter 3 verse 7 When Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn, and she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And I can't help but think of the incarnation where Jesus came and ate and drank, which he wouldn't do again. He would not do again until the kingdom. I'm seeing Boaz going to sleep as the crucifixion. Ruth appearing at his feet, being covered by Boaz's garment. That's the, the righteousness of God. We've been clothed in Christ, clothed with Christ, justified, made righteous by the faithfulness of God. And listen the two rising up together. Did you hear me? The believer being both crucified and risen with Christ. Rising up together. So, Ruth stays the night until when? Until the morning. The morning. When Boaz arose, were that she arose with Boaz, she rested until morning. Can I say that again? She rested until morning. We too rest in Christ until morning. Morning being symbolic of our physical resurrection or rapture. And she rose up before one could know another. It was still dark, early morning. And he said, let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Let it not be known. No one is supposed to know that you are here. Okay? Let it not be known that a woman came into the threshing floor. Are you seeing that? Amazing. If you see, as I do, Ruth representing the church here, you see Boaz, who represents Christ, saying the church has no place within that area of work in which only he could redeem his people. Not only 
where, where that he could redeem his people, but also no place wherein he was threshing, where his, his judgment had occurred. The separation of, of grain from the chaff. The church has no place or purpose in the tribulation period at all. The church has no place in Daniel's 70th week, what we call the tribulation period. The time of Jacob's trouble. No place in it. No judgment for the believer. Even now, there's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. I want you to see the tender degree of intimacy between Boaz and Ruth, which represents God and His relationship with us. Oh, folks, dearly beloved, I hope you see that. I love you all. I truly do. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.